So the work I want to talk about today, uh, the recent uh, and unpublished work, comes from uh, Chinese graduate student Yu Chong Wang, um, two uh, Turkish postdocs, Dugu Dikicioglu and Aicha Kankoru. And the uh, proteomics part is done in conjunction with my colleague Catherine Lilly, who's also a professor within the Cambridge Systems Biology Center. As an undergraduate student, I found two subjects incredibly boring. Uh, one was taxonomy and the other was metabolism. And really, the genome sequence changed all that. Uh, having a complete genome sequence meant that one could now start uh, to do experiments in evolution, interventionist experiments, um, together with, uh, <coughs> with Daniela Del Neri, who was uh, a graduate student of Carlos, perhaps the second or third best graduate student that, that he'd had. Uh, we re-engineered the, the yeast genome uh, using a technique where, the, where we could target uh, translocation events. And uh, now Valentino and, uh, and Carlo have developed a much more reliable uh, method of calling, uh, doing that, which I'm going to talk to them about this afternoon. And metabolism, well, having the complete uh, genome sequence meant that we could relate all of the genes to all of the actions in the metabolic network. And so, you know, yeast metabolism has been studied since the time of Pasteur and, and the Buchner brothers, so this should be something that's very easy to do. Uh, so that's what I'm going to tell you about this morning. Uh, and at the start, I'd like to... Uh, pay tribute to a man who I think is the forgotten theorist of, uh, of metabolic modeling. And this was Donald Rumsfeld, which those of you old enough will remember was uh, <coughs> uh, defense secretary in both the, uh, the Bush, G.W. Bush, and before that, the Gerald Ford administrations. And he was a conceptual master in terms of uh, of uh, metabolic modeling, because he taught us that there are known knowns, there are things that we know we know. Uh, we also know there are known unknowns, that's to say we know there are some things we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, they're the ones we don't know we don't know. And this is very important. And he was defense secretary. <laughs> <laughs> and he was defense secretary. And we thought, you know, with his metabolism, we'd be very much in the domain of known knowns. Little did we know. <coughs> so if we start with the known knowns, having the complete genome sequence of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you can then uh, construct a complete model of the metabolic network. And so you take down the, uh, the map of uh, metabolism from Boeing or wherever, of which I noticed Carlo has stuck to the wall out, outside his office. And then you can, in the computer, reconstruct this metabolic network, including the transport processes, the direction of the reactions and their stoichiometry, all the components, the metabolic intermediates, which are required for growth. You can specify the nutrients available to the organism in the external environment. And you then have a whole series of 1,000 plus uh, equations, differential equations, which represent each and every uh, enzyme-catalyzed reaction in that metabolic network. So that's quite daunting mathematically, but if you assume a steady state, uh, then you can reduce all those differential equations to linear equations, which can be readily uh, solved computationally. And then you need to constrain this model, and note this model only has uh, directionality and stoichiometry of reactions, there's no dynamics, no kinetics. You can constrain this model by uh, calculating, say, uh, optimizing the rate of biomass accumulation, the growth rate, or you can constrain it by minimizing the use of oxygen or maximizing production of ethanol, or whatever you might wish to do. And then you can start to test whether your model and this technique of flux balance analysis is, is a good one by running these simulations in the computer, these flux balance analysis simulations, in which you can start to withdraw reactions from the network. And you can then use the computer to predict the phenotype of those gene deletants. 
And so first of all, you can start predicting the phenotype of single gene deletions. And this works pretty well. So the earliest incarnation of the yeast metabolic model uh, was right about 80% of the time in predicting essential genes within the yeast metabolic network. And then we all got together at uh, one time in Manchester to pool resources and construct a consortium model. And that was yeast one, and we're now up to yeast seven. And as that model got more and more complete, uh, then a large and larger fraction of the known essential genes encoding react enzymes catalyzing reactions in the yeast monobenetic network increased. Uh, but then the most recent version of the model, yeast 7, uh, which uh, introduced compartmentation, uh, introduced a lot of lipid metabolism, which wasn't previously incorporated into the model, things started to get worse again. The predictive success rate was not so good. This is worrying. And then if you make an even more stringent test of the accuracy of your model by trying to predict the phenotypes of double deletions. So here we're fortunate that uh, Charlie Boone in Toronto is using a very clever and automatable genetic technique constructing all possible double mutants of all uh, 5,800 or so protein encoding genes predicted by the used genome uh, sequence. And so this means uh, that it has about 10 million double deletions to construct. Uh, three years into the project, it had only done uh, 4%. And interactions were rare. So cases where both single mutants were viable, but the double mutant was dead, so-called synthetic lethality, occurred at a frequency of about 0.6%. And so we sat around thinking, well, Charlie and especially his Canadian graduate students won't work very hard, and we Brits are notoriously lazy, uh, but we're supposed to be smart, yes? Yeah? So we said, well, we could save ourselves work uh, by using the metabolic model to predict the genetic interactions rather than laboriously going through uh, every pair of, uh, of genes uh, one by one or two at a time. <coughs> so if you look at gen genetic interactions, this is something which a, a grown-up geneticist would call epistasis. Um, Fisher, who was at one stage the Balfour Professor of, uh, of uh, Genetics in Cambridge and really founded quantitative genetics and much of statistics, defined epistasis as follows, that the phenotype of a double mutant can't be predicted by simply combining the effects of the component phenotypes of the single gene mutations uh, multiplicatively. So we define this epistasis coefficient, which is the phenotype of the double mutant minus the phenotype of the product of the two single mutants. So these phenotypes need to be quantitative. Uh, would give you uh, the epistasis coefficient, which would be positive if the uh, double mutation alleviated the effects of the single mutant, or negative if it was more severe, for instance, lethality. So we reasoned then that we could predict epistasis using flux balance analysis and this genome scale metabolic model. This we set out to do and also involved the famous Daniela Del Neri. And we simulated all possible double gene deletions of non-essential genes involved, as far as we understood, in the yeast metabolic network. And we predicted close to 90 cases of synthetic lethality involving 60 gene pairs. And we performed experiments to confirm these. So single deletion, viable. The other single deletion, still viable. Heterozygous diploid viable, but when you sporulate and get back to haploidy, then you get a three to one segregation of three viable spores and one either absent spore clone because the, the double deleting is lethal or very weak colony. Where, so this is a synthetic lethal or sick interaction. And so so we predicted a number of these, and I'll just give you a small sample of the data. 
And about a third of the time, uh, our predictions were confirmed by experiment. But we'd reasoned that we should be able to be right about 50% of the time. And we were worried about this. And so Daniela was a, a good Catholic girl, so she prayed hard. And she appealed to the font of all knowledge, the genome sequence. And what she found was that for the cases where our computer simulation predictions with the metabolic model were confounded by the empirical data, then there was usually a third gene in the genome, which was a power log of one of the two genes which was in the original input cross. And then if we made the triple mutant, <coughs> then we could construct that. And if we remembered that we were supposed to be uh, systems barges, things were supposed to be quantitative, and so instead of just squinting at colonies on agar plates, we measured growth rates. Then we could find uh, synthetic sick phenotypes being uh, conf confirming the predictions of our computer model. So this looked very good, although it was worrying if it's 10 million uh, crosses to make all possible double mutants. I leave you to uh, think for the rest of the seminar how many crosses to make all possible triple mutants. So if we took into account quantitative growth phenotypes and the construction of triple mutants, our hit rate went up to about 56%. We thought it was really good. And so, you know, Charlie Boone is a wonderful guy, especially if you buy him a few drinks. And so we bought Charlie a few drinks. Um, we persuaded him that he should move up in the priority order uh, genes to do with metabolism uh, to make his, his double mutants. Uh, he had no interest whatsoever in metabolism. He was much more interested in things like cell cycle and so on. But, you know, some drinks later, and never drink with Charlie. He would drink anybody under the table. Uh, he had agreed to do this. And so we then predicted for, uh, <coughs> for all possible double gene deletants in uh, Saccharomyces of genes we knew had something to do with metabolism, what the phenotype should be. And this work was initiated by Balash Pap, a uh, brilliant uh, Hungarian scientist while he was uh, with me in both uh, Manchester and Cambridge, and then was completed by a student of his, Balash Zapanos, when he returned to, to Zeged in Hungary. And so what we found was that if we compared uh, our predictions from the computer on a sort of global scale with the empirical data which Charlie and his robots and students obtained uh, in, in Toronto, uh, th then our model had done very well. And we found there were some general rules that uh, Genetic interactions were far more prevalent when the two genes both operated within the same domain of metabolism, for instance, both within sterile metabolism here. And they were much more rare uh, if you looked at genes in different domains of the metabolism. So uh, OxFos here and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and lipid metabolism here. What's more, we predicted that for these cases where the genes were in the same domain of metabolism, then you would frequently find either positive or negative interactions. So cases where the double mutant uh, phenotype was more injurious than that of, of the single mutants, or cases where it was positive, it was uh, less injurious. And this gives you this horrible term, monochromatic score. So you found that Mutants within the same domain of metabolism tended to be uh, at the green end, was a mixture, but mutants from genes in different domains of metabolism tended to more often give you all positive or all negative interactions, exhibit so-called monochromatism. So we're feeling pretty good about this, but uh, the devil was very much in the detail because then if we look for individual cases as to how successful we've been, uh, we found out that really uh, our metabolic model, to use a technical term, was crap. Okay? So if uh, you look at uh, the precision of our model, how frequently our predictions were, were right, um, it was not bad. It was between about 20% uh, and 50% for negative and positive interactions. 
But if we then looked at the recall, that is, the proportion of all positive interactions and all, uh, <coughs> all negative interactions and all positive interactions, which had been generated by experiment uh, in, in Toronto, then it was terrible. We only uh, found 3% of all the negative interactions that Charlie had found, and only 13% of all the positive ones. And even if we look for very strong interactions, we only moved those scores up to about 17% for, for negatives and about 25% for positives. And this was very worrying. And what's more, it was also rather humbling because uh, people working with E. coli were doing better than we were. Yeah? And so was it possible that we know less about the metabolism of E. coli than, less, than we do about yeast, which has been studied from, from the mid-19th century? So why were we missing all these interactions? Well, the model could be incomplete, or it could be wrong. Uh, the model has no concept of regulation, either at the genetic level or the metabolic level. The way biomass is defined in the model, and remember the constraint which we place on the model is to optimize the rate of biomass production, uh, is pretty poor. I mean, it's cobbled together from some fairly recent data in Jens Nielsen's lab, a lot of ancient data from the literature, and what's more, the same definition of biomass is used uh, whatever the strain of yeast used and whatever the physiological circumstances. And this can't be right. And finally, uh, initially we found in the, in the model that an uncompartmented model with none of the cellular compartments in it uh, had a higher prediction accuracy than ones uh, with no uh, with compartments in and that present we're probably even, that it makes very little difference in the frequency of the scores, whether you have the compartments in or out. Maybe we're a little ahead now for compartmentation. <coughs> so let's look at these possibilities. The first is that the model is incomplete. And to try and look at this, uh, we use uh, a robot scientist. So this is something that uh, Ross King and I have been developing over many years now. And the concepts of the robot scientist that you can have uh, a computer which is a reasoning engine, uh, can erect hypotheses, uh, can uh, perform using laboratory automation uh, experiments to test those hypotheses, take uh, the results of those experiments and compare them uh, with its predictions, correct its model, go round and round that loop. And so we gave the robot access to information in the public databases. Um, it could do experiments and it could uh, look at uh, <coughs> different uh, the results of deleting different genes and we could then infer which genes, or the model could infer or induce which genes uh, were responsible for encoding the enzymes which uh, s carried out specific reactions. So we know there are unknown, uh, known unknown. So we initially constructed a logical model of yeast metabolism, so even simpler than the, uh, the stoichiometric model, no stoichiometry, no dynamics, just a directed graph where uh, the nodes are metabolites and the edges are reactions. And you can get to, you specify all the metabolites needed for growth and the cell can grow if and only if there's a path from the nutrients in the external environment to all of these required uh, 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 compounds. And when we constructed this model, we immediately had a task for, for the robot scientists, which we called Adam. And, uh, and that was that there were a number of reactions which were orphans. In other words, uh, we knew either from direct biochemical experimentation or by the fact that if yeast couldn't carry out these reactions, it had to have a metabolism different to the rest of certainly the eukaryotic or even the whole of the living world. <coughs> but we had not yet been able to assign uh, the genes which encoded the enzymes which catalyzed those reactions. So we set Adam to work on this, and what he did was we gave him the uh, EC numbers for all of these reactions, and then he could search the public databases uh, for the annotations of, 
of genes which uh, encoded products with the same EC numbers, could then compare back to the yeast genome and predict which uh, genes encoded uh, the enzymes for these orphan reactions. And Adam did pretty well. Uh, he made <coughs> about 20 predictions. Uh, in nine cases, he even confirmed or refined previous annotations which were incomplete. In six cases, he corrected uh, wrong annotations. In three cases, he shed new light on old genes. In other words, it demonstrated that some genes have more than one function. And in one case, it was just spectacularly wrong, where he attributed a transaminase reaction as being encoded, the enzyme being encoded by BCY1, which is a very well-known regulatory gene in yeast. But of course, he, Adam had no concepts of regulation at all, and uh, no data on regulation he used. So that was a sin of omission rather than commission. And so we rolled up our sleeves and did some bucket and spade biochemistry and confirmed three of the predictions by doing in vitro enzyme assays. And meanwhile, normal science went on, and six of Adam's predictions were confirmed by, by others. And so this was the first instance in which a machine had found new scientific knowledge independently of human intervention. And uh, even the Americans had to admit that for once the Brits had done something uh, a bit special. OK, so we showed that there were missing reactions. The model is indeed incomplete. But is it wrong? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is yes. So when we got the results that the detail of the predictions was wrong, even if the general topography of genetic interactions across the whole of the metabolic network was correct, we decided to make a virtue of necessity and take the empirical data from Charlie Boone's lab on the phenotype of these double mutants of metabolic genes and use uh, a genetic algorithm then to try and improve the metabolic model. And so the algorithm could uh, remove reactions. It could change uh, the directionality of reactions and so on. There was a limited number of things which uh, it was allowed to tinker with. And one of the things that it predicted was that uh, if you deleted either or both of these two genes, which are in the early phase of the pathway from aspartate to NAD, nicotine adenine dinucleotide, then the predictions uh, which were made uh, were markedly improved. The predictive efficiency of the model was markedly improved. So again, we went back to the font of all knowledge, uh, the genome sequence, and we searched uh, for, these, for genes that could encode these two enzymes, and we couldn't find them. And so then we started to make deletions in the other pathway to, uh, to NAD biosynthesis from tryptophan, and we found if we deleted any of these BNA genes, uh, then the cells became uh, nicotinic acid oxytrophs. But if you supply nicotinic acid in the external medium, they could grow perfectly well. In other words, this pathway from aspartate to NAD doesn't exist in yeast. And the very first yeast metabolic model uh, was constructed by uh, Bernard Paulson and, and Jens Nielsen, and they sort of piggybacked it on uh, Bernard's E. coli model. This pathway exists in E. coli, but it doesn't exist in yeast. So again, you have to trust your genome sequence. OK, so these are our uh, known unknowns. And we're starting to put those right. But there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. And if you're looking again at the detail of the model and its predictions, you find that it's particularly poor on making predictions to do with nucleotide biosynthesis. And when we started to go into this, and it was the two Turkish postdocs that did this, we found that it was a problem of the uptake of nutrients and specifically that of iron. There were general problems in the model with iron uptake and utilization. And although iron <coughs> is... Uh, only considered as ferrous in the model and is taken in the cell, is not utilized extensively. There are a number of dead ends in the model which um, 
means that uh, the uh, utilization of iron in, in the metabolic network is not correct. So this, uh, on the most recent published version of the yeast metabolic model, is how iron metabolism is represented within the model. And Duga and I just had to work to improve this and improve the predictions of, of nucleotide intermediates. They extended the model to make it much more comprehensive for iron metabolism. They had to invent a new approach for handling coenzymes and cofactors in stoichiometric models in order to achieve their ends. They even had to specify how many active sites for that reaction were available per enzyme and how many cofactors needed to be bound to each enzyme. And therefore, they could only uh, put things right for rather well studied enzyme cofactor relationships. <coughs> so they added uh, 35 new species, either metabolites or cofactors, 20 different types, 18 reactions. And they made a rather uh, modest uh, change to the number of metabolites in the metabolic model and the number of reactions. Uh, but in terms of representing by, by the model predictions the, the biomass yield on glucose, things were now looking much more realistic than they were before. So this was a very worthwhile addition. And so this was the representation of iron metabolism in the model by the time Dugu and I should finish with it. Okay, so model is incomplete and it is wrong. Are we missing genetic and metabolic interactions? And the model has no concepts of regulation. It's a major challenge at the moment to have a regulatory layer to the model. A problem which has uh, been ignored, certainly by me, for far too long, is that the background, the strain which the, all the deletions were made in, has a number of oxytrophies. And Jack Pronk told me years ago, this is all wrong. You have to work with prototrophic strains. And I, that's an old-fashioned yeast physiologist. It doesn't matter really. We have the same mutations in all the background. But in fact, um, <coughs> Michael, uh, Michael Mulsala in, uh, in Mar Marcus Rausser's lab uh, in our center, uh, cheered on by me and by Uwe Zau in Switzerland, uh, constructed a plasmid which contained uh, the wild-type versions which would complement all of the oxytrophic mutations and therefore converted all 5,800 deletins into prototrophs. And you can see this has a considerable effect that uh, s even single gene deletions in defined media in which you're supplying the oxytrophic requirement uh, can have uh, a considerable uh, effect. And, and double mutants like the LU2, LU3 Lu uh, double deletin uh, profoundly reduce uh, the growth rate and modestly re re reduce the yield. And so I think for a lot of the experiments we do, uh, we do in continuous cultures, so we know uh, that these things aren't limiting growth, but most people work in batch, and this is a serious problem. The final thing is the definition of biomass. And this seems such a basic, even boring thing, but really, it's the uh, elephant in the room of yeast metabolic modeling. Everybody knows that it's a problem. Everybody knows that our representation of biomass can't be accurate, that it's simply not true that the uh, chemical constitution of a yeast cell doesn't change irrespective of what physiological uh, condition you're growing in. It would be great to have some good empirical data under a range of different physiological conditions uh, for uh, the, the composition of yeast biomass. Um, how to do that has been very uh, well mapped out by uh, chemical engineers like uh, Seth Heinen in Delft and uh, Greg Stephanopoulos uh, at MIT. And they've even gone extensively into sort of uh, the validations one should perform and the statistical treatments one would need to do. But they've never done it. And I suspect they've never done it for the same reason I've not done it, is you can't find a funding agency who will pay for it because it's boring. Uh, it may be boring, but the whole edifice of synthetic biology can collapse if we don't get this sort of thing right. So 
We started to do in silico experiments, and Dugu Dikijioglu did. So how does changing the biomass composition affect how the model predicts the distribution of flux through the metabolic network? So we have this problem, I've said, the, a uniform biomass is employed, composition is employed in the models, regardless of the physiology, regardless of the strain used. It's based on mainly very old empirical data, rather primitive analysis techniques compared with mass spec and everything we have today. And whilst everything in the model has improved as time goes on, this has stayed the same. What's worse, it's a bit like the monks copying mistakes in ancient manuscripts. Uh, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae biomass com composition is often used in, in metabolic models for other yeast species, such as the industrial yeast pickier. So we performed in silico experiments varying the composition of individual biomass constituents. So we would reconfigure the biomass, but still keep the numbers within the range of the empirical data that was available in the literature. Investigated how this affected uh, the distribution of, of flux within the network. And we also compared uh, non-limiting conditions with conditions limiting for specific micronutrients, glucose, ammonium sulfate, and phosphate. <coughs> so the first thing was that uh, making these variations had a profound effect on the flux distribution. Uh, one of the two largest effects was when you varied uh, the uh, cell wall constituents. This perhaps we should have predicted. Uh, the yeast cell wall is a third of the total biomass. But also uh, amino acids, Uh, and, and nucleotides also had a profound effect. Then you can ask, okay, can we uh, use the model and can we use uh, our calculations for one condition to predict what should go on in other conditions? And we found that phosphate limitation was an outlier, that you couldn't use uh, non-limiting conditions to predict what should happen within phosphate limitation and you couldn't use phosphate limitation to predict what would happen in non-limiting conditions. The others were all fairly well correlated with each other, but the things which were strongly uncorrelated, again, were structural and cell wall components. And moderately uncorrelated were the content of these amino acids. <coughs> so the definition of biomass is certainly wrong. It needs to be condition specific, and we don't have those data. But we can predict that it has, not having those data has serious consequences. Finally, compartmentation. Most of the attributions of which enzymes are in which compartments in the yeast metabolic model either comes from sort of uh, intelligent inspection of where those enzymes should work, or comes from uh, data from GFP fusions and microscopy. And the problem with GFP fusions is that they can uh, allow uh, proteins to be misdirected. So Yu Chong Wang developed a, a new way of gently lysing uh, yeast cells using nitrogen cavitation, <coughs> separating then the cell contents to isolate the different uh, subcellular compartments by uh, two different gradients, so, uh, an iodixanol gradient and uh, a single step sucrose gradient to get at the mitochondria. And then used uh, two dimensional LC and then mass spec, mass spec, 2D MS, and TAN and mass tag density labels. <coughs> and then by applying multivariate statistics, you could then start to divide up all of the proteins in the cell into their respective compartments mitochondria, plasma membrane, vacuole, et cetera. And this approach, which was developed by Catherine and Lily, is known as LOPIT, for localization of organelle proteins by isotope tagging. <coughs> so Yu Chong, at the time this slide had made, had quantified uh, about 1,600. I think he's up to 2,000 plus now. Uh, yeast proteins with <coughs> an error of uh, less than 0.01. Uh, close to a thousand of these proteins have been located to eight major subcellular organelles. 
And then if we compared our data with that obtained by GFP, uh, the agreement's not bad, but where it goes badly wrong uh, is with uh, the nuclear fraction, and also that we have a much larger class which we label as ambiguous. And ambiguous could be uh, that our cell fractionation is poor, that we break up organelles, but it also would, <coughs> would be a reflection of the fact that many proteins move from one compartment to another and so should be attributed to more than one compartment. On the other hand, if we compare uh, our LOPID data to where the proteins, the enzymes are in the, the latest version of the yeast metabolic model, the agreement's very good. So it suggests that it may be a problem, but it's not a huge problem. Although, again, you'll see that nucleus is a bit of an outlier. So for nucleus, you can predict which proteins will localize the nucleus using computer algorithm. And LOPID is correct 78% of the time, <coughs> or agrees with this predictions of the algorithm 78% of the time for nuclear location, GFP only 71, 81% of the time for cytoplasmic location, and GFP only about 65. So we think that using this uh, direct biochemical assay of where proteins are, where particularly enzymes are in the cell is very well worthwhile. <coughs> So if you look at the false negative predictions of the model, 39% uh, of these enzymes were not detected uh, in our LOPID analyses, but of the remaining 60%, uh, close to half conflicted with our LOPID data. And that allowed us to, if you like, upgrade these false negatives into true positives. Of the false positives in the, in the prediction data, somewhat less than half were not detected in our biochemical LOPID data, of the remaining nearly 68% over a half conflicted, and this allowed us to downgrade these false positives to true negatives. I said that the recent uh, improvement of the metabolic model, uh, which has resulted in a reduction in its, pr its predictive ability, has largely been uh, concerned with extending uh, the representation of lipid metabolism. Lipid metabolism is very difficult to deal with, both in a modeling sense and also in a metabolomic sense, because differences between lipids are usually differences in a few double bonds. So if you look here, there's this, these very important fatty acid synthetase enzymes, <coughs> and these key fatty acid intermediates, hexadecanoic, octadecanoic, and octadecanoic acids. And in the yeast metabolic model for its predictions of essentiality, they assume a rich medium and that these, uh, these fatty acids are taken up from the environment. So the problem is that these fatty acyl, uh, uh, amino, fatty acyl acid uh, synthesizes and fatty acyl CoA synthesizes, the model for making its essentiality predictions assumes these are imported to the environment, but in the model, these, uh, these enzymes are required to be, in fact, if you read the biochemistry, uh, they're required for the uptake of the, uh, of the fatty acids from the environment, but uh, within the model, uh, they're localized cytoplasmically. <coughs> so these key F FAA enzymes are attributed either to the ER membrane, the proxysome, only one case to the cell envelope, and again to the ER, whereas from our LOPIT data, our, our proteomics analysis, we attribute all of these to the plasma membrane, and in this case, ambiguous, either the cytosol or the plasma membrane. So that can repair the deficiencies of the model, puts the enzymes in the right place to be involved in the uptake of these compounds. And in general, what we find is that by having the uh, localization data, it's not so much that enzymes are in the wrong place, but often that uh, the transport of metabolic intermediates from one compartment to another are not properly represented. 
and we need to exclude some of these transport reactions and we need to improve the uptake. And it's very difficult to identify which intracellular transporters uh, transport which intermediate. Other cases you get surprises. So there are these two proteins which are involved in, uh, in arginine metabolism and herbocerine hobo metabolism. And from our, in the metabolic model, they're cytoplasmically located. From our proteomics data, we find them in the cytoplasm, but we also find them in the nucleus. And very recently, papers have appeared in the literature implicating these two proteins as being involved in uh, ubiquitin-mediated proteolysis via the proteasome within the nucleus. So again, you can find more light on the fact that many proteins, many enzymes, are bifunctional. <coughs> so we were proud of our metabolic model, just as we were proud of our genetic map before we sequenced the genome, but many of its predictions are wrong. These are a result of the model being incomplete or wrong, the known unknowns, the fact that we're missing genetic and metabolic regulation. These are both known and unknown unknowns. That our definition of biomass is faulty. This is a known unknown, but one that everybody has been ignoring. And that compartmentation is not accurately represented, especially in terms of transport and exchange reactions. These are more unknown, known unknowns. <coughs> so I have to thank the people who have done the hard work. So graduate student Yu Chong, Dugu and Aicha, two uh, postdocs, Catherine, a fellow professor who runs the proteomics lab, and then my external collaborators, Ross King, now at the University of Manchester. When he was in Aberystwyth, I tried to get into Manchester and failed. And when I moved to Cambridge, I tried to get into Cambridge and failed, and he ended up in Manchester. Such is life. Balash Papp, who was with me in both Manchester and Cambridge, but is now in Zeged in uh, southern uh, Hungary, and Charlie Boone in Toronto. And thank you very much for your attention.